Solid Waste Rate Study. Uh, I wanted to uh, just take a moment to introduce you to the committee and let you know these are the people that got together and worked through the numbers and felt that we have the best comfortable thing we can do to face the challenges we have ahead. Uh, the members on the committee, uh, at first, um, Dave Keisler was on there as a council member, and then uh, we had uh, Peter Arth and uh, Mike Delabato and um, Louis Dewey as the citizen members. We were also assisted by Mario Rubino, working from the treasurer's standpoint, and finance director um, Blake Michelson. And uh, we also had Paul Ruder and, of course, city manager Mark Brannigan working on this. Okay. Now, yeah. You might point out that Peter Art did such a good job, they elected him to the city council. Hey! Yeah. Yeah. And that happened to the city council members, and David stepped off. So that's how we are where we are right now. So what we did, and this is uh, something that I, first of all, went through back in 2015. I first got involved in the city when I was a citizen member on the solid, on the water rate study. And uh, through the whole of 2015, we had a committee of the same size that met for two or three hours, probably a dozen times. And just to explain what we do when we meet, is we simply look at what are the expenses, what are they projected to be over the course of five years, and how do we come up with the sources to meet those needs? There's no other black magic involved. There are some things that we have to do in order to be qualified for grants. So that works into the equation. But the bottom line is, is that we as members, whether we're on the council or just citizens, have no desire, no, no incentive to raise rates above what the exact minimum is. And I will tell you that there's a couple of questions about how to deal with solid waste but when it came to the water waste, the sewer rate study, we went through a series of decisions where Mr. Ruder asked us, okay, how about this? On this decision point, how do you all feel? We went through that, went through the whole exercise, and not once did we have one thing where one person said, I don't like that. It was all unanimous. Which means that when we looked at these numbers, and if you want to look at the numbers going forward, they're available to you. If you look at the numbers, I trust you'll see that what we've come up with is the bare minimum of what we can do. And the challenges we face as a city is, is that as a budget, uh, we have to make sure that we meet the requirements for discharging into the water, into the river. Uh, we have to meet all the various requirements in order for us to be able to um, exist as a city. And so those are the, the realities we face. We all know that we don't have the money. We wish we could keep the light, uh, the, the rates going down. But inflation has been around since I was born, and I think that's what we're dealing with. So as we go forward, I'm going to turn it over to City Manager Mark Brannigan to kind of introduce uh, the process from his viewpoint. We've gone through this process where, besides the meetings we've had as a committee, we also had a workshop before the city council meetings, one for the sewer rate and one for the solid waste. And so the council has had a chance to look at this. What we're doing right now is we're moving towards what's called the Prop 218 process. The Prop 218 process identifies all the people in the area that are uh, customers, if you will, of the system. Who all is getting the uh, use of uh, sewer, sewage, sewer for that? The point is, is that as we go through this, each of these different areas require that we meet the needs, and after this is all done, we'll come up with a mailing going out to all the people who are the service that are customers, and there will be an opportunity for people to protest. And what that means is, is that of, let's say, uh, 1,600, I believe, that was the number of individual uh, customers for the water rate study, roughly. And with that in mind, um, they needed about 800 protest votes in order to overturn the proposition. Just to let you know, I felt really good about the fact that we worked hard enough and explained it well enough that when it came time for the vote for the water rate study, we only had 40 protest votes. So there's no magic, there's no finding out ways we can make more money if sewerage does something different. It's simply looking at the numbers, and I trust that you'll agree, no matter how painful it might be, 
that the people who came together and brought their wisdom together, the ones who knew they were going to get hurt a little bit along with everybody else, they came up with those decisions. And with that in mind, I'll pass it on to uh, Mark Radigan. Thank you. Um, I'll keep this short and sweet so we can get to the presentation. Um, this is not something that uh, I'm sure anyone here is uh, happy about, um, but all, all agencies have these, these painful moments where you have to uh, address the uh, inflationary pressures that are placed on, on everyone. Um, and, and we'll get into that in the presentation. Um, I would like to say that to get to this point, uh, the, the, the city council formed a committee that, that we have sitting uh, in front of you today uh, just over a year ago. And uh, we've had a, n a number of public meetings where the committee met to really look at what, what are the challenges and what can we do to overcome those challenges or to address those challenges. And uh, we had the fires. Uh, that kind of put things on the back burner for a few months. Uh, and then we came back in and had some more public meetings. Um, in December, the city council, at the city council meeting, uh, we had the first presentation, which was the, uh, uh, the sewer presentation, uh, which, and then we had, in January, we had another presentation on the solid waste. Uh, after that, we went to the city council and asked, what would the city council like to do? We've, you know, we've had all these public, public meetings, we've uh, been at this for, over, you know, for a year now, uh, and the, the reserves are falling short. So we don't have a whole lot of time, we need to do something. And their direction was, we, you know, we haven't gotten a lot of people coming to these public meetings. We want to make sure that everybody out there, all the citizens, all, all the property owners, have a say in this. Um, we want to get a better turnout. So we you know, really did a hard push to make sure that everybody at least knew about this one. It was very important to the city council that everybody knows that we're having this, that this is a discussion for this community, to the, the shareholders of these systems. Come in, we want to hear, the council wants to hear your voice. Um, so staff uh, worked with the paper. Uh, we put ads in the paper. There's a front page ad. Um, we have, uh, we did a mailer, staff did a mailer to everybody's door. So hopefully you all received that. Website, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, we did everything we could think of to make sure that everyone who was concerned has the opportunity to come out. And we want, the, the council wants to hear from the community uh, before they move forward and what, uh, what has to happen going forward. So this, this is, you know, one of those, another opportunity for everybody uh, to come in and, and speak. So thank you for coming. I know it's, it's the middle of the week, 6 o'clock, raining. raining, cold. You don't want to be here. It's not the funnest topic, but thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to our engineer, Paul. Um, and speaking over here. Paul, uh, just real quick, he's, uh, I think you're, are you the president of Face Civil Engineering? Uh, he's uh, grew up and was born, I think, and raised in Weed. Uh, and is one of the, the main engineers for Peaceful Engineering and Reading. Um, Paul is, a, is amazing, you'll see. He, he's, he understands the communities here. Uh, he gets it. He works well with the staff, with the, the committee. And I'm so fortunate and I feel so proud that we've got him on this team. So thank you and climb up. Thank you, Mark. Well, tonight's topic is sewer and garbage. But there's been a number of questions from uh, folks in, in, the, in the city, as well as council members, relating to not only garbage and sewer, but water. Well, what's the city doing with the money it's been accumulating from the water rate study back in 2015, 16? So this is the best crowd we've had in all the public meetings. So we thought it was a good opportunity tonight to kind of share with you, give you a status update on the water and sewer infrastructure projects. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to start out with that and then we'll dive into the sewer rate study and the solid waste or garbage rate study. Everybody's okay with that? No? Tell you what, it's okay, we'll go ahead and sit in the back, it's easier for everybody that way and now that uh, we've all been a member. I already figured that out. I know. I call on Peter. Well, 
for the people that came out tonight, I think it would be useful for you to let them know about how long your presentation is. Yeah. I came, I listened to this presentation ten times. So I really want to hear from you and hear the presentation. So I hope that we'll be talking for any of you that came out to be here to say whatever you want to say. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely the idea. I've, I've got probably 28 or 30 slides, so you know I can go on for an hour. And if you guys would like to skip the update on the capital projects and do that at the end, anybody in favor of that? Not a pretty good show of hands. Maybe we'll just stick with the agenda and we'll just go through the rate studies and then those that want to hang around for an update, okay, let's do it that way. Aren't the capital projects notated on these boards over here? Yes, they are in part, yes. Okay. And, and when I get to that point, I'll kind of describe how they relate to that. Yeah. Okay, I think we're off and running here. So we'll start out talking a little bit about the sewer utility rate study, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history of the sewer fund. Well, the city's last major planning document relating to the sewer system was done in 2007 and then many of you probably recall a couple of rate increases that occurred about shortly after that time uh, beginning in 2010 I believe it was one in 2010 and one in 2011 and the the revenue that was generated from those rate increases were put into a fund called the capital replacement fund so one of the things that, that happened about that time is those rate increases allowed the city's um, sewer rate to meet a minimum threshold to qualify for grant. And so the city was able to qualify for about five and a half million dollars grant towards a, a major uh, project to their wastewater treatment plant and collection system. It ended up being about a seven and a half million dollar project overall. Uh, there hasn't been any sewer rate increases since 2011, and uh, just CPI level, uh, consumer price index level inflation since that time has been about 16 to 22 percent. So what that means is that expenses have continued to increase, and the revenue stream hasn't kept up. But we have been paying for nine years on that rate increase. $10. Yeah, and during that time, there's been nine years of inflation too. So, yeah. Okay, so the current status of the sewer fund, uh, the fund generates about, uh, through rates only, about $558,000 a year, and then the rate increases that went into effect in 2010 and 11 generates about uh, 186000 the annual expenditures and debt obligations are about 900,000, and so if you add those two numbers together and subtract your expenses, you're almost $150,000 in the hole. So the capital improvement fund that was established in 2010 pays for uh, debt obligations towards other capital projects. It also covers minor capital improvements, those that the city can accomplish with with cash, but uh, as you guys know, the cost of doing capital projects for replacing infrastructure is extremely expensive, usually in the millions of dollars, not in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So by the end of the, the current budget year that we're in, the overall sewer fund balance is projected to be about 629,000. Well, that sounds pretty good. But when you look at the breakdown of the sewer fund, there's an operating reserve that's uh, in the negative, about 280,000. The capital improvement fund continues to build based on the rate increases from 2010 and 11. And then there's about 180,000 of restricted funds. Those are funds that the city has to set aside to comply with uh, long-term loan financing and that kind of thing. So basically, the, these banks tell the city, hey, we'll loan you this money, but you've got to keep this amount in reserve for a rainy day. So that money really isn't available. So the total sewer fund balance, 526000 Let me go back real quick. So the, one, one point here is that because there hasn't been any rate increases, 
this number continues to get more negative. And so I'll talk about some strategies that we discussed as a committee for dealing with this. So one idea that the committee liked was to use a portion of the capital improvement fund to fund the following, to help fund some of the shortfall of expenditures. That will, in effect, lessen the rate increases needed. Use a portion of the funds to establish an operating reserve. That's a, a reserve, uh, a rainy day reserve. You know, some, if you visited a financial consultant and asked them how much money should I have in my savings account, they're probably going to tell you, well, you know, if, if you can build up to a three month reserve of your monthly expenses, that's considered sound financial practice. And that's kind of the same concept that the city uses within its enterprise funds. 25. So about that would be about a three month out of 12, right? Okay. Uh, one thing that we like to do in our financial plan is fund a collection system replacement project, and I'll talk a little bit more about that and the uh, specific details or components of the project are shown on that plate right there. So we'd like to establish a five-year financial plan just like the city did with the water rates. One advantage of that is it can, um, it can implement policies and procedures over time rather than hitting the ratepayers with these huge changes in year one. So five years gives them a chance to kind of build things up and, and uh, become more acclimated. And then there's the 25% operating reserve you asked about. So in terms of uh, call these revenue needs, it's another way of saying expenses in the enterprise fund. But the, the column here in the middle that says budget 2018-19, those are actual numbers from the current city adopted budget. And so there's a number of accounting items in the budget if you've ever looked at it. Uh, but I tried to consolidate it uh, to make it a little easier to follow. But it, essentially, there's about 300 and 25,000 in personnel costs, operating expenditures, includes a lot of different things, about 400,000. The city's currently paying about $173,000 a year on existing long-term debt. And so the total expenditures for the sewer operating fund as budgeted this year is about a little over 900,000. So the column on the right here is what they these expenditures would be projected at the end of the five-year planning period. Okay, so just envision I, I'm not showing the four years in between there. If you want to see those, we've got the draft rate study of the city and, and so on. But it kind of gives you a sense for, for what we're recommending. And so you can see the existing personnel costs here. They, they would go up by inflationary type numbers, 2.5% per year. Uh, a big deal that we wanted to point out here is the need for the city to hire a grade three wastewater treatment plant operator. Uh, the state regulates your wastewater treatment plant and they've been applying more and more pressure to the city to bring in an operator that meets that certification. Um, for several years now, my firm has been providing contract operations to the city and the state's asking, well, Pace is 50 miles away. How are they able to give the plant the attention it needs from that far away if they're not there every day? And it's expensive for us to be there every day. So we're getting pressure, the city's getting pressure, and that's that's an expensive uh, endeavor. So that's what that 112,000 is there. Operating expenditures, we actually show it going down by the end of the five-year planning period. And the main reason for that is because out of operating expenditures, we're creating um, a reserve called a short-lived asset reserve. And we did the same thing within the Water Enterprise Fund. And what that is intended to do is accumulate revenue to replace short-lived assets. Those are pieces of equipment, pumps, things with a useful life of like five to 15 or 20 years. They're not really operating expenses. You're replacing short-lived assets. And so it's, Short-lived assets. Yep. Keyword. Yep. And so it, it is considered 
you know, in a public agency enterprise um, to separate that from operating expenses. And so we made that recommendation. And so that's what this, this number is down here. And so in the previous slide, I mentioned the desire to do a relatively big uh, collection system replacement project, around $4 million. Kind of depends on how much grant the city can get. But the, the annual debt obligation to pay out that loan is about 122 and change, and that sum is about 1.2 million. That's at the end of the five-year planning period. So in terms of the sewer rates themselves, in reviewing, um, excuse me, city water consumption records, the average home in the city of Dunsmere consumes about 200 gallons per day during the months of January, February, March. That's on an average basis. Just residents. Winter boards. That's right. Yep. And so uh, it's it's very common practice, especially today, uh, to use water consumption as a basis for establishing sewer charges. And so what many agencies do is they say, okay, well, we're going to assume that 90% of that water that you use in January, February, and March gets into the sewer system. And so 90% uh, of 200 is about 180 gallons per day. Typical resident. So currently the city has a, a fairly detailed rate schedule for sewer for its non-residential customer base. And it's fairly old and it was established at a time when that was the common way of doing it. But it's very empirical and uh, probably isn't extremely fair to everybody. Uh, for example, it tries to classify you know, businesses, you know, it might be a salon or a laundromat or whatever else, but it doesn't get into well, you know, how many machines are there and how many times a day and a week and a month are those used. And, and so I think agencies did the best they could to create those rate schedules back in the day, but a more fair way to do it is based on water use. The more you contribute, the more you pay. The less you contribute, the less you pay. And so we'd like to eliminate the city's current wastewater billing structure that has 54 different billing codes and go to a water consumption based rate. So the, the committee's recommendation is, is that all accounts be billed based on 90% of wintertime water use. Why is that important? <coughs> in terms of the difference amount of what happens in the winter versus the summer, in terms of calculating rates, why would you want to do it in the winter instead of the summer? Yeah, the, 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 um, a couple of reasons. A, a really important reason is, is that we typically don't irrigate during the winter. We typically don't use water outside. And so if you try to use other months of the year, you've got to account for that water use that isn't going down the sewer. It becomes very complicated. So that, that's a, a, an important reason to try to focus on wintertime water use. But during the winter, we have sewers that don't use water. That's right. And their sewer rate would reflect that. But they Well, are, are, are you talking residences or non-residences? Yeah, residences would. Uh, and the rationale there is that Having the ability to discharge into the sewer is worth something. The city still has its operating maintenance expenses associated with the sewer system. It has insurance, it has regulatory burden to take care of, and that's you know that has to be picked up by everybody independent of water use. So that's kind of the rationale for that. Paul, can I add to that? Yeah. During like this is a time, this snowbird time, and this is where we get most of the rain. And the groundwater comes up. And those pipes, a lot of times that crack, and all that, a lot of times our I and I, which means groundwater, surface water, overwhelms our system. So we're getting, it, it's about what, ten times the flow right now because of all this water coming in. But we still have to treat that water at a very high cost, and it, they're co they're coming from some of those homes that nobody's in there because their pipes are open, cracked, and that's. What so about our drought years? Though? On drought years. Well, there's, do we still have the pipes and they're still getting old? Yeah. All right.
Okay, like I mentioned before, residential rates will still remain flat. They're still technically based on wintertime water use, but the residences will, will maintain a flat rate. Non-residential rate impacts uh, will be kind of all over the map because of the nature of the, the city's current rate structure. But the bottom line is, is that most non-residential accounts will experience some type of rate increase to a varying degree. Approximately 74% or three quarters will see a rate increase. About 16% would see a, a decrease in sewer rate. And uh, about 10% uh, would remain the same, or roughly the same. This is all based on past winter water consumption. But at the end of five years, based on the rates that we have shown in our financial plan, most of the non-residential -res accounts will see at least some type of increase. I don't, I'm uh, sorry, I don't quite understand. You had up there that residential rates will remain flat? That, I don't, right. I don't understand. What, what am I not connecting between what's here and what's there? Flat compared to everybody else, all the rates will be the same, but they still will have increases over time. Yeah, so, so what, we're, what we're trying to say is that if you're a resident, your monthly sewer rate will always be the same based on that rate schedule. So it'll be a flat rate. It won't, won't be based on your water meter usage, say. But if you're a non-resident, because of the high variability between you know, commercial accounts and institutional accounts and so on, then their sewer rates will be based on actual okay. water. That's worded a little strange up there then relative to this. I would assume flat meaning it's not going to change. Well, it isn't for the year that it's established. So it's, it's a flat rate, so and, and it is a, a word probably one of the Yeah, in, in this table, you can see right now your current rate is about 4008, and you probably you can't read through that green. I'm proud of you if you can read that. Okay, yeah. Uh, but I think it's in your handout. Yeah, it's going up about five bucks a year. Exactly. So when we say flat, we're saying that you know, for this year, it's $40. Pardon me? From month to month over the course of a year, flat. Is that what you're saying? That's right. From month okay. to month That's right. okay. versus you here. That's right. Yeah. Does that clear it up? Yeah, that does. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, just that one statement up there seemed a little counterintuitive or something. All right. I, I apologize for that. Yeah. Um, so basically to, to accomplish the goals that I've kind of described here in terms of establishing an operating reserve, utilizing some of the accumulated capital reserve, trying to fund some capital projects, but not ever all the city needs. We've developed this rate schedule, and as you pointed out, sir, uh, it's about a five dollar, a little less than five dollar increase in year one, about five here, four here, four, and one at the in the fifth year. And those are the level of rate increases it would take to accomplish the goals that I just described. So as I indicated, by the end of the five-year planning period, the city would be able to maintain a 25% operating reserve. It would still have just under $100,000 in capital improvement fund. It will have completed a $4 million collection system project. It will have employed a grade three wastewater treatment plant operator. And will have established a short-lived asset reserve for replacing assets with useful life of five to 20 years. So th this graph is put together to kind of show a relative comparison of the city's current sewer rate, projected sewer rates against other agencies. And I think you'll probably be able to read it better in your handout, but um, kind of see the, the big red bolt here. This is the city's current rate relative to other agencies. You have Mount Shasta here, Red Bluff, Anderson, this is weed current and weed in four years. And you have McLeod, Willows, Wairika. This would be the proposed Dunsmuir rate uh, next year, 45. And then this number here represents the 2015 
uh, average wastewater rate in California. I haven't been able to find a more updated survey of that, but I'm sure one exists. I would expect it would be a little higher than that now. So we're still below average. But, uh, yeah, based on yeah 2015 numbers, it, and it, it's projected to go above average, obviously. This is Nevada City, uh, City of Reading here. This would be the, the five-year Dunsmuir rate. Uh, this is Mount Shasta's uh, about four years rate, three, maybe four years from now. City of Ashland, uh, City of Shasta Lake, and City of Williams. So it, it just kind of gives you a, a relative comparison of where the city's rates are relative to other agencies. Uh, Paul, if you would explain why the fact that we have to put water in the river makes it different than Mount Shasta and we well, the, the, that is a big factor in these rates, and Mount Shasta, they, they do discharge to the river, and that's why their current rates are going from here to here. Uh, the city of Wheat, for example, they're in a different regional board. You get north of Black Butte Summit, they're draining to the Klamath River, they have a completely different regulatory body and there are no discharges to surface waters allowed in that region. And so the city of Weed takes their wastewater uh, up Highway 97, and it's either used to irrigate alfalfa fields or it goes into these big, basically big leach fields. They're called percolation beds. You know, that kind of disposal doesn't require the level of treatment that the city of Dunsmuir and Mount Shasta need to discharge to the river. And so that's, you know, that's directly reflected in your wastewater rates. Manchester doesn't uh, have that uh, line that pumps up by 89. Uh, for Mount Shasta? Yeah, they have a line that pumps sewer water up 89 and then into leach fields. Not they, the they do, but the regional board has told the city that uh, they need to substantially reduce the amount of water they put in that leach field or add treatment to be able to continue to do it because their monitoring wells are showing nitrate levels leaving that site and Dunsmere downstream. So, pardon me? Uh, they're right here. Why do you include cities that are not the same per capita and the same um, uh, number of residents? Well, if I only put on the agencies the size of Dunsmere, I'd only have three or four up there. I tried to hit on all of the Siskiyou County cities and other cities that I was able to get great information from. But we're comparing apples and oranges, not apples and oranges. Well, it's just, you know, I, I, I don't have any agenda with this. I'm just trying to present information and you guys can do with it what you want. Make your own call. I'm just trying to show. Yes, sir. So so once we get everything fixed and get on board with you know everything being up to par like everybody else might be or so, will the rates ever go back down? Well, yeah, I'm not convinced that... Just as much as they did the last time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just saying a lot of this is based on repair, right? Well, it, it, it's it's repair and, and it's regulations. and, and, and the $4 million sewer project that we're proposing here isn't all that the city needs in its collection system. That's all that we're willing to try to commit ourselves to fund now so that the rates aren't $100 a month. And so the approach going forward will be to, okay, let's, let's try to get something done with rates and then let's continue to look at any and all grant opportunities for other work to try to hold the rates down. That also, the repairs will be done by a loan in part. Okay. And so repaying the loan will take place over many, many years. Okay. So that's one thing that will stabilize yeah. with inflation. Yeah, I've been kind of watching this question for some years. I knew this was going to come to late. So this rate hike here exactly, it will not be funding any improvements. Uh, this is only going to be a correction for the O and M. Isn't that right? No, we're, we're proposing to do a, a capital improvement project within this rate structure, the $4 million collection system. And how much money are you, are you allocating from the fund now for that specifically? 
well, uh, nothing. We can't afford to do anything so right now. The two things the citizens should know is that we're not we're not going to be repairing all that's wrong. This is a, a, a four-year plan to get a grip on some very serious issues the town has, but not all the issues. These issues started many years ago, and we have quite a distance to go. And the real reason, I think it's fair to say, for this rate hike is to stabilize our, our operating and maintenance costs uh, associated with this fund. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, some of you probably heard, you know, reports on the state of infrastructure in the United States. And it continues to deteriorate and the federal and state governments aren't putting the money out there to be able to replace that. Meanwhile, it continues to get older and older. Dunsmuir is not alone in this. All the other communities in Siskiyou County are in the same boat. And, you know, most of your sewer and water infrastructure was built in the 1910s and 20s. And there's still pipelines in the ground that are that old conveying wastewater or drinking water. And, you know, things just don't last forever. And, you, you know, we, the city has had some major water main breaks in the last two or three years. You've probably maybe seen it or heard about it in the newspaper, but huge, you know, big 12-inch lines, old cast iron lines that we thought, oh, that probably got 20, 30 years of useful life. Boom. You know, blows up with 150 pounds of pressure and washes out roads and everything else. So it's, that infrastructure is going to continue to deteriorate and Dunsmuir is not alone in that. You know, that, that's really on the water side. On the sewer side, you have the same challenge, but then you have the Regional Water Quality Control Board saying, you need to remove ammonia and copper and zinc out of your wastewater. And oh, by the way, it's going to cost several million dollars to do that. Um, those are regulations that were actually set forth by the EPA in the late 90s. And the state of California gave cities until 2010 to comply. And that, that was the first wastewater project that the city did in about 11 or 12. Well, that permit gets renewed every five years. So it got renewed again in 2015. And guess what? There's additional requirements in there. And I'll, I'll talk about that when we get to the infrastructure projects. But it's, it's very challenging. And especially for small communities like Dunsmuir that have a relatively small rate base. You know, when the city of Reading faces these regulations, it's got 90,000 rate payers that help spread the cost out. Dunsmuir, we, Mount Shasta, and McLeod don't have that luxury but you're still held to the same regulations that the city of Reading is. I'm not saying it's fair, but it is what it is. Yes, ma'am? Are you saying that if we had, you know, twice as many people living in Dunsmuir, we would get some relief individually? Well, it, it you know, it, it boils down to an economy of scale. Um, if you had twice as many people, you would probably need a little more infrastructure to accommodate them, but by by spreading the cost out over more people, there's there's this economy of scale, so uh, everybody has a reduced expense. Um, it's not quite a one to one. So in other words, if if you added three thousand people and it cost you another. $2 million to be able to accommodate them, you know, that's not 10, and that's not 15 million, it's two. And so you've got, but you've got 6,000 people paying the bill instead of 3,000, and, and so it, it probably doesn't answer your question very well, but I apologize for that. But the point I'm trying to make is that the more rate payers that are paying for a service, it reduces the cost for everybody. Do we have the grant already in place? For, for the waste, for the sewer? No. Because, so you're applying for it right now. That's right. And then it says that it fits the state's intended use plan. Right. What is that? That's a scary question. Yeah, well, that's that's a, a great topic. When I finish the solid waste, we'll talk about the infrastructure projects, if you don't mind. 
That way we don't yeah, get totally off. Get, yeah, as long as we all get to talk about that. That's sure, awesome. absolutely. I just some folks came in just want to talk about sewer and garbage and leave, so I want to make sure we're not pulling the wool over but their eyes. But we may have to do something we don't know about based on the state's intended use plan. If we if we go for the grant, they're gonna have, maybe have something in there that we all don't know about. Like I don't want to wake up one morning and find a 5G tower in my front yard. Or yeah, I, I'm being understood. extreme, but that's yeah. my point. Is we're, we're like sitting here asking for money to help, right. but they will roll something in. Well, I, I think you make a good point, but from my perspective, when the state imposes these types of regulations, they establish these funding programs, like the Proposition 1 money that the states, that you guys have benefited from. And so I think, you know, in their little piece of heart, they acknowledge that they've got to be able to help these communities fund these regulations that come down. And so in my experience, they don't have those types of strings attached that you described. They're really geared toward solving water quality issues for downstream users. And so I'll talk a little bit more about the treatment plant project, but that fits with what the state wants to do. What happened in 2010 with the things that were not taken care of because, because of our great reduction? They took some things out that were not taken care of that were never taken care of? For example, um, the existing collection system efficiency, efficient way, all kind of uh, implication of info, capital outlet, whatever else, wastewater treatment plant, because stone bathroom. Um, yeah, and if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about that very thing when we finish solid waste. Okay, so uh, kind of slides a little late, we've been answering questions, but uh, feel free to, and we can come back, there's nothing formal, ma'am. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Um, on your, uh, State wants us to hire a person to man the sewer system. Grade three. Grade three. Right. Hundred twelve thousand plus. Right. How much do you guys charge? Um. Well, we charge less, but for a lot less attention, and the state doesn't like that. They they want somebody that's there more than we can be from ready. And if we were to charge the city to be there daily, our cost would be three or four times that at our charge out rates. So basically, we've been trying to help the city for several years now until it can get its own grade three operator. Charging less than 112,000. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been discussion on sending one of the existing operators to school to become grade three? Yeah, and there has, and um, that hasn't worked out, and maybe someone from the city can uh, comment on that, but yeah, that has been discussed. Mark, you want to elaborate a little bit? Uh, the city does have somebody that is actually uh, going for his grade three exam, I think this month, um, and we're, fingers crossed, it's a very difficult uh, exam. Um, that's why we have to pay so high to, to get somebody for that kind of certification. So we're hopeful that the, the employee does get that certification. We're also investing in the employee. Currently, we're looking at getting him enrolled in the apprenticeship program. Uh, that we're hoping to get some uh, also assisted funding for that. Um, and we have money in the budget for training uh, for those operators too. So the city is very supportive in trying to get its existing staff uh, up to those levels. Um, so we're doing everything we can. I have a question for you, Mr. Mark. Who is that city employee? Uh, it's Dennis Del Delvano. Dennis Delvano, okay. I have more questions. I'm a city council and I'm about to spill some beans here because the city has hired, we've had two people that we have paid to go to school. They got their grade three. Some other city want to come along and say, I'm going to pay you this much money, and they've all left. Yeah. Dennis isn't leaving. He's the Dunsman I true and through. He's going to get his grade three and he's going to stick around for Dunsmere. So I've got to give him props. But we have tried. We pay him $3,000 a month. That's what we pay him. We need our own grade three operator. And part of the reason we got a break now is because we hired a city manager who is a grade three operator. <laughs> but he's leaving. 
So here we are again. We got them smashed. So uh, with Dennis stepping up, and I, I wish him God bless him, all the luck in the world. But I think that we finally got somebody that's going to be beneficial and an asset that does with something that we've truly needed for a long time. Our own grade three operator who's not going to leave. I just thought we set the record straight because they offer like $160,000 a year, and of course we're going to leave. It's a top, top paying job. But we got one that's going to stick around, so we're on it. And he's a great guy. Yeah, and he's a great guy. <laughs> oh, oh. So, uh, how many are on staff at the sewer plant total? Uh, we, we have, uh, well, the utilities, we, we kind of have a uh, water and sewer. They work together very closely just because they're so small. Um, so we have, uh, we just hired a new person over there. So that increases our water to uh, four? Five? Okay. Yeah. So we, we just increased it to five. So we have one retiring. Uh, nobody, nobody's retiring right, right now. Oh, no one's retiring? All right. So we have, we have three that work full time in the sewer department then? Uh, they, they flow. So a lot of the positions flow where they spend time in water and in the sewer. So they do wash their hands in the pool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how much time do you have invested getting your grade three? Oh geez, it was, it was a long time ago when, when I got my grade three. Uh, back at a time where I used to work, they needed a grade three, and I, I got it. Um, and then he left. Yeah. Just like the hardest thing. It's uh, a lot of time. The, the grade three, without getting into great detail, it's it's very complicated because you have chemistry, algebra, uh, and biology. It, I don't know if you realize it, but wastewater treatment is the harvesting of microorganisms that take what we waste and to them their food. So they break it down and then there's this process of microorganisms breaking these things down to a point that is inert. Uh, so it's very complicated. You, know, you, you have to be able to keep those bugs healthy and uh, alive. And uh, there's lots of different systems of ways to do that. And that's what these, these people that did the grade three have to understand. It's very complicated. You have to, for a small system, so there's, the people in the bigger cities that have a lot more treatment systems have a probably an easier time because they're hands on. So uh, it's very complicated. Thank you. existing rate structure is probably allowing certain user classes to subsidize others okay and so basically we're we're spreading now out based on benefit and use and so that reallocation doesn't allow the percentages that you're talking about to really work out okay sure. oh ma'am he deferred to you. <laughs> yeah, I those percentages that we're proposing aren't intended to just offset inflation. They're intended to get the fund back in the black. And so yeah, the, the rates have the increase have to be more than inflation in order to do that. No, I understand. That's. I, I, I understand that, but I would rather, you know, you have to be able to afford it too. Right. And through grants is how we need to do it. Right. Right. 
Sorry. Sir? The, the non-residential codes, it sounds like there were a lot of different pay codes. Right. Is that why the rate varies current fiscal and next next five years is there's a there's a figure there that's standardized and a single $45 yeah, so, so basically how it will work is if you're a non-residential account, the city will look at the average of your water use for January, February, March. Like everybody else. Yeah. Right. And then... And right now, that's not... No, that's not occurring. Well, it, it's... Uh, I, I call it an empirical code. You know, it, it's it's supported by a study that was done back in the day. The old study yeah, but it, but it wasn't... Uh, you know, it, it was it was done based on the standard of care at the time, but that's not the way public agencies do it now. They base it on water use, so it's just a different approach. It's outdated, and it needs to be simplified and more fair. Much simpler this way. Right. Sometimes they don't need January, February, Yeah. Well, they all all they need is a a range of dates, right? Through there, it, 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 the times don't have to cut off exactly at the date at the end of the month if they have a two month reading they know that 60 days or 58 days or whatever the case may be so that will be taken into account any other questions before we move on to solid waste yes ma'am non yeah the non-resident customers are basically everybody else that isn't a house so it's commercial it's schools uh um, vacation home? Vacation home. No, if, if a vacation home is a resident, if they're a house, they're still in that residential category. Um, but any any account that isn't a house is, is we're qualifying as non-residential. Mm -hmm. But you can raise it too. Uh, yeah, but basically the rates are they're they're going to be raised for everybody. So if you're a non-residential account and Let's say you, you average 360 gallons per day during the winter when an average house uses 180, while well, you're using contributing twice the amount of water that a house is, your sewer rate's going to be twice the amount of the house. That's how it's going to be set up. And under Proposition 218, uh, that's considered the fairest way to do it. Those people are only charged for their, their impact. Has anybody ever so, done a rate plan for a community or a city that's been based on their usage? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I've done them for uh, Weed, Mount Shasta, and Wairika in the last year, and I'm getting ready to do one for City Shasta Lake. And that's just, that's what public agencies are doing and have been for four or five years. That makes sense. In terms of the method? Well, no, not necessarily, because the revenue requirements don't change, no matter what the rates are, right? So it's basically what we're trying to do is apportion the cost the most fair. And to satisfy Prop 218, it has to be that way. Any other questions before we move on to solid waste? Okay, and you guys can you know ask me sewer questions at any time. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about solid waste or garbage. You guys like garbage or solid waste better? Garbage. Garbage it is. Okay, so the garbage fund uh, includes garbage collection or refuse collection. Historically, it's provided street sweeping and tree trimming uh, as well as tree removal along some of the right of ways. But recently, the city's uh, received recommendations from its legal counsel that, that those services need to be removed from its garbage fund. The city is exploring other means of providing these services to all of you. I don't know that anything's been solidified in that regard. The city's still working on, on that. So the current status of the solid waste fund, just a little bit of history, the solid waste rates will reduce uh, pretty substantially in March 2016. And that was largely because of a, a pretty good reserve that the city was collecting. And it, the reserve kept building and building. Uh, so the city reduced the rates quite a bit. Um, I, I, wasn't too, I wasn't involved at that time, but I suspect that the idea was to reduce the rates 
down below what was needed to cover expenses and utilize the surplus, you know, spend the surplus down, basically, which makes sense. Um, currently, annual revenues are about 289,000 into the garbage fund. <coughs> annual expenditures are about 397,000, and so there's about a hundred eight thousand dollar shortfall. In, and and that, those are based on numbers in the city's current budget. So the end of 1819, which would be June 30th, 2019, uh, it's projected that the, the fund balance would be just a little over $200,000. So we'll get back to that, but in terms of uh, the financial plan recommendations, and, and we're recommending the same approach that we did for water and that I just presented for sewer, which is a five-year uh, financial plan. And it's even more important in the solid waste fund because of the rate increases that are needed to make up that $108,000 shortfall. You don't want to do that in one year. The rates would have to go up 40 to 50% in one year. So uh, recommendations for the financial plan is to remove the street sweeping and tree trimming from the fund. Uh, maintain the current rate structure in terms of container sizes and frequency of pickup. If, if you've ever seen the, the garbage rate schedule, there's a ton of different categories in there based on the size of the container, the number of that size container, the frequency of pickup. But 93% of customers in Dunsmere utilize one category. I think that's okay because the city has commercial users come in and out and their need for garbage collection can change can change seasonally, can change based on their business changing, and so I think it's okay for the city to have that extensive list of possibilities for uh, setting up a garbage account. So our recommendation is, is that it keep that rate schedule as it exists. We just recommend that they change some of the rates in there. Ma'am? Hi, thank you. I've, I've only lived here a year and a half, but when I moved in, I had like a certain garbage bin. Are you telling me that I actually have a choice? Because I never fill that garbage bin, never. Nope. My, my understanding is, is is that the minimum size garbage bin is 65 gallon, or 68, 65 or 68, I forget. That That's the minimum size, is my understanding. Yeah. 65. Okay. So there isn't there isn't a smaller one. Ma'am? I'm going to know maybe we move the street, but the tree and train in the train because I have all the very lots of trees over my head. Right. Um, yeah, that, that that's a service that the city has historically provided under the garbage fund. But it's been determined by the city's attorney that it, it can't do that any longer, at least out of the garbage fund. So the city is exploring other options to try to provide those services, because it is an important service for all of you. But it just can't be done out of the garbage fund anymore. So there, we don't have an answer on how that service will be provided at this point. All I can tell you is that it won't be a part of this fund. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so similar to the water rate study, similar to the sewer rates that we just discussed, we're in our five-year financial plan, we're uh, projecting a 2.5% annual inflationary increase on expenses. Uh, and we're proposing to utilize some of the surplus funds remaining in the garbage fund to help offset the need for these rate increases. There still are some surplus funds, but like I said, there's about 200,000, and each year you're going in the whole 100,000. You know, you don't have to be a math whiz to know in two years you got nothing. And then you've got no reserve fund to try to offset expenses, so that's when you need that 40 or 50% rate increase that we're trying to avoid. Okay, so uh, we're recommending a 20% operating reserve for the solid waste fund. Uh, let's see. Other solid waste fund goals, uh, obviously, we've talked about it, try to establish a means to fund the street sweeping and tree trimming services that the city has done historically. 
uh, explore and potentially implement a, a green waste collection program. Yes. I know that's yeah. Mr. Deutsch. Um, I'd like to talk to that. Um, I, I myself am a, a huge um, ecology environment person, but what we're dealing with here is that when you're talking about recycling in any form, you have to have a market for what you're coming up with. And so there are no green recycling facilities anywhere in the county. And the reason is that for a city to take on putting together an operation, coming up with the expenses to operate that, you don't have the revenue coming in to make up for it. Uh, it actually was made worse recently because I believe China has said they're going to stop taking recyclable goods from the United States, which is going to make the market even worse. So it's not that anybody in the city is, is against green waste. Everybody, I think, is for it. The idea right now is and we're looking to find a way to make it happen, but economically right now we don't have a way to make it happen. I think you look at the other cities in the county, you'll see why that is. It's the same, same struggle. So we'll continue to look and we'll continue to try and find ways to work it, but it's not something we can plan on assuming it will be in here since it's uh, for me, perfect. Well, it's, it's a general. We also right now pay uh, to have recycling and uh, we also pay the recyclers uh, a sum of money. So re recycling is part of, the co of your uh, solid waste bill right now. And if, if we would like to do more recycling, that's a potential, but it would be an increase again in your bill. Also what happens is we actually pay out, I believe, $5 per person for uh, the, the, uh, um, free, the blue bags that go in because they have to actually pay now by state law the people that are working there a living wage, which you would hope they would anyway, but in any case, that actually increased the cost that we have to pay to actually have those blue bags recycled, so thank you. $5,000 also comes in yearly for recycling from a grant. Excuse me, Paul. At, yes. at, the, at the risk of interrupting the flow, um, unfortunately, the implications of not providing some sort of avenue for the brush and leaf removal overlays very heavily on fire danger in our area, which I think all of us will agree, kind of is something we need to prioritize. And uh, we have a huge property at the airport, yes. not to say that it's the ideal place for all this stuff to go. But I utilize the, the main dump in Mount Shasta a lot, and at certain times of the year, I'd say well over half of what's in there is a combination of leaves and, and greenways. So it's, it's, not like, it's not like there isn't some kind of trade-off. I, I understand exactly what Bruce is saying. The equipment to deal with it seems a little daunting. I'm afraid that the implications of not dealing with it could be even more disastrous. Yeah, you make a great point. And, and really, it boils down to the language of Proposition 218. Proposition 218 is designed to allow the city to go through the process with this protest vote for services that it can tie a direct benefit to your property from. It's easy to do that with water and sewer because each of you have your own water service and meter, you have your own sewer lateral. But on the garbage side, it's easy to do for garbage pickup. But trying to incorporate more community type benefits of tree removal, tree trimming, street sweeping, it's hard to drive a street sweeper down Main Street and spread that cost to every citizen in the city. Because if you live up at the end of Oak Street, you're going, well, they didn't sweep my street. Why am I paying for that? And it, it, do, it doesn't. It doesn't get through Prop 218, and so that was the essence of the city attorney's recommendation when it comes to that. It could be funded through the general fund, but that would take a you know a vote, and I, I forget if it's half or two thirds. But anyway, go ahead. I'd like to commend the city. The city did allow dumping of clean leaves last year at the maintenance yard right across from the Sacramento Avenue. Now, now, unfortunately, that information 
seemingly was not very well disseminated, and I'm not sure how many people were able to utilize that. And I think that was wonderful that they did that. I took advantage of that. It saved me from having to drive all the way up to the dump and pay, you know, a, a pretty penny. Not that I wouldn't actually pay some here if they needed to compensate for, a, for you know, providing that service. Right. Well, that's the secret to us. And even my city manager is like, what's he talking yeah. about? So yeah. it's a secret. We didn't know that. Well, and that's why I say I commend the city for allowing it, and, and it might have been a little better disseminated. Better disseminated. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, I want to say that I, I actually, and my sister spent a lot of money at the height of the fire scare last year on to haul a truck and a car full of yard, you know, waste. Both of us bought our houses recently and it hadn't been cleared for a long time. And I called and she called, we both called City Hall to ask about green waste here in Dunsmere and we were told that there was nothing happening here. From the city, you know, whoever it is who answers the phone at City Hall. And I, I just, I'm astounded that we don't have any kind of green waste for yard trimmings, leaves, and such when we have so much property around here. And there's a lot of people here that have less money and less wherewithal than I do to do this. And it is a danger to everybody that lives here when you have a neighbor who cannot afford to clear their yard. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was a, a big point, but it wasn't a point that we could talk about with what we're talking about tonight, solving the uh, garbage pickup, um, because the state laws precluded. And at the time, I said, okay, then we have to get together as a community and figure out what the city is going to do about it. And so that's why I'm really happy to hear this input, input tonight, because that topic has got to come up under a different meeting, but we have to deal with it. I do see something as a short, uh, you know, I'll give you a second. Uh, there, I do see something as a short term solution. And that is that, um, as I said, I really don't believe we have the ability or the resources to be able to start up a recycling operation per se. But at the same time, uh, we did have, and we have in the last couple of years, been, been uh, paying to have days where you can bring things down to a dumpster, and that would then take all of that out of here as one big dump without people having to worry about it. So we'll take a look at that. I know that uh, and we've done that in the past. I don't think we have it. Do we have it in the budget this year, Mark? Uh, no. Okay. So, yeah, so we could work on doing that. I'm just saying that if somebody wants to be very bold and put a lot of energy, I'd love it if you want to try and come up with a way to do green waste. But as far as a city and a budget and rates, we really can't wrap that into what we're doing right now. So we're just trying to say, based on what we have right now, but above and beyond that, we'll work to see if we can get some, uh, you know, at the end of the, the year, when it's time all the leaves are coming down, to get them picked up. Okay. Do, 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 you, do you recognize, though, the potential oh, impact, certainly. illegal dumps and all these leaves? Because most of the fires travel by means across the ground, not through the crowns of the trees. It's on the ground and all those dry leaves and all that brush. So people won't bother to pick up because what about the airport? Can can we utilize? That's only what a mile and a half from town, as opposed. I know at one time they were doing something. We'll look at that, but let's get back to this and I'll yeah. continue yeah. to look on this. Yes. I just want to say one more thing because you know I, I've been living in San Francisco for 37 years and I've seen the whole evolution. And I'll tell you what, garbage. The the volume of garbage has been reduced significantly by composting and recycling, and that does affect our solid waste rates. If we, could, if we could divert and reduce what we actually have to throw in the dump, it will reduce our, our rates. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter, yes. I don't think I need a microphone. <laughs> I just want to say one of the reasons I ran for the city council is my frustration that the city refuses to deal with bullet one and bullet two. And I know some members that have left this community in frustration because they say, why don't we recycle? Why don't we have a green waste program? So I hope you will all come 
tomorrow night or let your city council members know that in fact you want to establish a means for street sweeping and tree trimming to fire harden our community and take the burden off of those who can't do it on their own that you want to have a green waste collection program because the prior speakers are correct california is a state Siskiyou is a county Duds here as a community, we can do much, much better. I put my little blue bag out in the snow last week, and oh my God, I put a tuna can in there, and I put two wine bottles in there. And what happened is whoever picked up my blue bag extracted the tuna can and the two wine bottles and put them in the snow just to let me know. That's not okay. That's not part of our recycling program. But for those of us that are trying to look to the future, what if there's major vegetation management in both the city of Mount Shasta and Dunsmuir, and we either use the airport or the south landing in Mount Shasta to accumulate all the green waste to grind it up, to take it to the Roseburg Cogen plant. There are ways to do this, and the whole point of this is we're raising our garbage rates in order to make the system fiscally sound, but why not spend a little bit of that money on a consultant who would design for the city of Dunsmuir, or we share it with the city of Mount Shasta how do we deal with our recyclables and our green waste? So I hope those of you that care about it will talk to your city council members and support us being the best rather than the worst. Thank you. Yeah. 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 One, one last. Since we had the preach, let's have the preach. Um, we can, as, a, as citizens, there's a lot that we can do. But we are citizens of the city, and when we ask the city to do things, we are making the statement that we will pay, that we will fund it. We are incorporated in the city. These ideas are far from new. We've looked into recycling several times. The green waste at the airport was almost started, we ran into troubles with Water Quality's Recess Board, Resource Board, and if those that say they participated, participated more, they would understand that we would need to put in a pond liner, we would have to do active uh, participation in that pile and seeing that pile process, and, and it would cost the city. Now as citizens, we could all agree that that was worthy of our tax dollars, which would mean it would be an increase of our funds that we pay every month. If those are the types of things we want, yes, we can have them. As far as recycling, we have looked into recycling several times. The biggest problem with recycling is there is everyone in the city that would love to do it. There is no cost-effective means of distributing those materials when collected and seeing when funded. I will say we have some great rounds of economic development block grant money coming to the city. Anyone that would privately want to take on a green waste pile, they could probably lease property from the city. Anyone that wanted to do recycling, if they come up with a business plan and they can make money at it, they should. It is way cheaper, way cheaper by far, to do a private enterprise than it is to ask city with its unionized employees and its government regulations to do that same project. So if it is something that this council decides that they want to do, the citizens just have to agree to pay for it. This conversation tonight is one of those same conversations. It's a conversation of this is the collection fees that we provide you as citizens, and this is what you need to pay. And, and if we're worried about increases, then 
adding more things to the budget is fine, but we're going to have to pay.
as, as far as you know, establishing the cost of service, uh, I would argue that we didn't look at this year's budget. We looked at what actual expenditures were in previous years. It, you know, tree sweeping and tree trimming and well, but, but those expenses are easy to take out, right? So I can take those out. I, I, I can look at past expenditures and we can get a sense for the administrative costs that the city charges. The city recently renewed an agreement for collection and hauling, and that's kind of a fixed price. So I feel like we, you know, the committee did a few diligence to establish a cost of service. But one thing I would like to point out is that the committee brought up a lot of the things that you just did in terms of green waste, trying to negotiate a more favorable contract for the collection and that sort of thing. The problem that we had is we ran out of time. And those kind of things that you bring up are gonna take probably several months to implement. And our fear was that if we don't act quickly on the financial state of the fund, we're gonna be out of money, and then we're gonna be facing huge increases. And so this, what we have proposed here is just a means for, for getting the fund back to right, but I think the committee acknowledged that either with that committee or another appointed committee, they would continue to work on the things you described. And I think the last few slides here kind of uh, kind of refer to that. Uh, other goals, you know, we kind of stopped and implemented a green waste collection program to explore other uh, garbage collection. Uh, those are the proposed rates. The, the 1644, by the way, I, I don't know where that came from. I, I didn't have anything to do with that. Uh, but I feel pretty com comfortable with the other highlighted rates that that's what it would take to make the fund whole. Uh, and then similar to the sewer, uh, this, this one is even more skewed because I found a rate study from the Central Valley that contained a lot of communities south of like Fresno-ish. doesn't really apply up here, but I had a difficult time getting data points. And a lot of those communities in the Central Valley are relatively small. They're disadvantaged in terms of you know their income relative to the states, you know not that unlike Densmere. So I thought it was, and you can interpret how you want. I'm not trying. I don't have an agenda. It's, it's just a data point. But I looked at the two, two at the end, Sanford and Delano. These guys here. Yeah. Yeah. They have 50,000 people in those cities. That's the largest in our population in the whole county. Oh yeah, not. I get it, they're, they're data points. And so you can say, well, why are they less than uh, Dunsmere? Well, because they have 50,000 people to spread the expense out, right? I mean, you know, so again. I just think your rates aren't set on costs. They're set on a budget. Well, they were based on a history of costs. We looked at financial for past years, which weren't budgets. Those were real <coughs> expenses. Those were real costs. So. You know, I, I, we could disagree on that, but uh, anyway, for what it's worth, you can kind of see, you know, we did have weed in there and City Shasta Lake and Mount Shasta, Redding, uh, Wairika right here. So we tried to get the Siskiyou County cities in there and the rest are kind of from all over California, but one, one you know, the, they, they're facing similar regulations that you guys are. You know, down in Central Valley, they, they have to play by the same rules. So, for what it's worth. Okay, important points here. Um, and again, the purpose of the five-year plan is to try to spread the need for rate increases out. Uh, adoption of the plan doesn't mean that rates can't be changed at any time in the future. It doesn't mean that the city's locked in to rates for five years. The city, my understanding is, will continue to explore the other options, the green waste programs, you know, negotiating more favorable contracts with potentially other haulers. But that's going to take time, it's going to take effort by some of you guys. But once that stuff is put in place, this can all be changed. All this is is a plan to try to make the fund whole. But it doesn't mean that you're, you know, signing something in blood that can't be changed. So again, I've made this point numerous times, but if solid waste rates aren't changed, the fund will be out of money in two years. And you'll have a $100,000 shortfall to make up in one year. And that's a big rate increase. So with that, uh, get the questions and then I'll circle back to talk about uh, kind of the city status on water and sewer capital projects. I think that interested some of you. So.
So any questions we'll follow race before we go there? I've kind of talked about a number of things. Jim? I'm curious about under ankle, what the contract with the race follower, how much that actually is right now. Yeah, what, what is, that's like, a, you guys recall it's like 150 something thousand? Or, yeah, I'd have to look at the, the report. I don't have it in front of me, Jim, but. You know that one right off the top of your head? You know all the numbers? Yeah. What it is, I don't know if you've seen a copy of the rate study, Jim, but we have, we have that broken out, what that contract is. Okay. And, you know, there's not, you know, it's not like, getting bids from a contractor to build your house, right? There's not a lot of waste haulers in Siskiyou County, so, you know, that plays into it, too. All right. Any other questions? We'll uh, move on. Those who want to stick around, we'll talk about uh, kind of the status of water and sewer projects, if you don't mind.
So our payments went down $7.04 a month. It has been $16.44 since 4 of 16, three years. Where are you now telling me that with our lower population residency, we have paid down the $300,000? As far as sewer increases, we paid 12 months, $5, and since the May 26, 2011, and through June 25, 2011, Bill, we have paid $10 almost nine years. Where has our money gone, and what have we received for what we paid for? I say no to increases until the questions can be answered. And I've already talked about my social security. Um, Dunsmuir is a financially depressed area. We can't afford this. On our property taxes, we pay already $63 for solid waste landfills. All of us pay that if we own a house. 2018 audit findings included Account receivable, payable, loans receivable have not been reconciled to the general ledger and accordingly do not match the general ledger. That's our payments to them. Uh, I say we need to fix this before asking for more money from us. This has happened ever since the 2011 audits. From 2011 to 2018 audits, they have not reconciled to the general ledger. Something is going on. We need to find out why. Okay. Well, a few of you stuck around. So, uh, I kind of want to give you an update on the status of water and sewer infrastructure projects. I know there's some of you have approached the city, uh, some of the questions that Mary brought up, you know, what's the city doing with these rate increase funds? Where's that money going? So I'm hoping to be able to shed some light on some of that tonight, at least as it pertains to water and sewer projects. So this first table that you see here, this is a table basically taken out of the 2015 water rate study. These are projects that were identified in the rate study as needing to be completed. Uh, the first two projects here uh, were water main replacement projects. The city was fortunate enough to get CDBG grant and IRWM grant uh, to do those two projects, and those are completed. We also identified the downtown tank relocation replacement project, and at the time we thought we might be a good candidate for IRWM, which I think we're now calling uh, RWAG, yeah. right? Well, it's still in Irwin. It's still in Irwin Grant, okay. So the, the point here is that in 2015, the city had gotten a grant for this project. The word on the street was is that there was going to be more grant in the next allocation, so we thought, okay, we'll get grant for this. And then the last two projects here were the phase one and phase two water main replacement projects. So if you recall from the 2015 rate study, our proposal was that these three projects would all be covered by grant and these two projects would be covered by loan. And so the total loan amount was about that much and that's what your rates were based on in, in 2015. Yes, sir. Is, is there a chance to have those, one of those last two things will alleviate this col constant coliform problem that seems to be in the water system? We'll get to that. Okay. I'll talk about that on a subsequent slide, but thank you for the same Okay. Um, so, uh, as soon as the rates were put in place, the city of Dunsmuir authorized the planning and design for this project. Because in order to qualify for the Irwin grants, you're a lot better off if you can go to them with, hey, I've got a shovel ready project, plans are done, environmental's done, show me the money, let's get to work. So the city did that. And so as that project stands, uh, the planning and design is done. It, it's, all it needs is a construction funding source and it's ready to go out to bid. It doesn't look like we're gonna get any grant money for it, unfortunately. 
the phase one and phase two water main replacement projects. Um, in 2014, the taxpayers in California passed Proposition 1. Proposition 1 was kind of a windfall to disadvantaged communities because they implemented a planning grant program targeted to smaller disadvantaged communities just like Dunsmere. And the idea was is that the city could obtain a grant to do all the expensive upfront planning environmental design, that kind of stuff, unless you've got several hundred thousand dollars sitting in the bank to pay a consultant to do that, you're never ready to do a project. So that was the intent of the planning grant process, and the city applied for a planning grant and was able to get a half million dollars, which enabled it to do quite a bit of work on this project. So my next slide is more of a current status. Okay, that was to show you a status of projects that we identified in the in the last rate study, and this is kind of where we stand. The downtown tank project is still there. Uh, you know, it, it's probably more likely going to be a loan. The planning and design is complete. As part of the planning grant effort, we were able to go in and kind of do a reevaluation of the priority list that we identified in 2015. That was largely driven by some huge water leaks the city's had in the last few years. I mean, major leaks, you guys are probably aware of them. So it kind of forced us to look at kind of reprioritizing things. So what I'm calling here, I'm calling phase one, phase two is the highest priority. Basically, those are the highest priority projects out of the phase one and two projects we identified in 2015, if that makes sense. Now, Kind of back to your point, uh, a number of months ago, well, the city's been struggling for several months with coliform bacteria in its water. Uh, recently, the state has come in and basically directed the city that you will install emergency chlorination facilities no. and, and you will make improvements to your spring wells and you will replace the exposed piping up there to try to eliminate the source of that cold form bacteria. So the emergency chlorination facilities does not mean that you're going to have chlorinated water from here on out, but what the state has been doing, and Mount Shasta has struggled with it a little bit too, is if, if, if you hit a positive cold form in your water system, you may have to chlorinate the system and you will be consuming chlorinated water during that period until the problem's taken care of and you get back on the but spring water. Happened. Here in Dunsmere. I have got no. a letter about that. No, that's because you don't have the emergency okay. coordination facilities. That's what the state wants the city to put in. That, it's, that's a million dollars to do that. Okay, so that, that's what this is here. So with the planning grant that the city got a couple years ago, we're able to do most, most of the planning and a good portion of the design within that, that grant. So, uh, you see this green project, that's basically, remember from the last slide, we had the phase one water replacement and phase two. That's the rest of the phase one and phase two that we still consider high priority, just not the highest priority. Right now, we don't, we don't have a means to fund that. We're looking for grants, anything under the sun, but we don't have the ability to fund that project with loan dollars within the current water enterprise. Bruce. So the extra dollars that people are paying now out of their pocket, what's going, where is that money going right now as for the last year or so? Where has it been going? What's it been spending? Yeah. It's been spending? Yeah. I'll get to that. It's in this slide now. Okay. So this, uh, this final uh, table here as it pertains to water infrastructure is just kind of a summary of these, these are projects that the city is pursuing funding acquisition with right now, as we speak. We're working with USDA Rural Development. So the downtown tank replacement project, the phase one, two highest priority projects, and then the emergency coordination project could be a very good candidate for the IRWM grants. I know Blake Michelson is, is part of the local Upper McLeod, Upper Sacramento region, and they've met several times as a group, and the group seems to like that project. There's going to be about $4 million that comes into this 
relatively small region, and there's a number of stakeholders and people that are trying to get that funding, but everybody seems to like the spring improvements project. So there's a, there's a good probability that we could get 100% grant dollars for that. If we do, then we would take that money and do more of the phase one, phase two, high priority projects, try to get more bang for the buck. So the sum of that project is, of all three components, about 11, just over 11 million. The city has contributed about $352,000 toward planning and design of those projects and another half million dollar planning grant. So there's a total of 852,000 from other sources. So that leaves a, a total project of about, oh, 10 and a quarter million. And that can be accommodated uh, within the city's current rate structure if we can get grant for this component here. And with USDA loan, there's a high likelihood that you'll get at least a portion of grant for that. So some people are probably wondering, well, what the heck's take, you know, taking so long? Why is it taking you guys so long to develop a plan for this? Well, we've spent several months trying to get Proposition 1 grants to do those improvements and not do loan at all. You know, just because we can afford loan, why would we not go after the grants? And we spent a ton of time and effort. The states come back and says, no, you're not going to get a grant through Proposition 1. So, you know, we worked 18 to 24 months trying to get grants for all of you to keep the rates down. It's not panning out. So now we're back to the original plan, which is to try to fund the project with, with mostly loan dollars. So, you know, city staff, uh, council members, its consultants, uh, we've been working like crazy trying to get the grants, but they are few and far between out there. So we've kind of come full circle. So just to kind of summarize, uh, in terms of recommendations here uh, for water infrastructure, uh, basically just recapping what I've just said, but basically uh, proceed with the USDA loan grant funding application for 10 and a quarter. Uh, like I indicated, the city's current water rate should qualify the city for some grant funding. You can get up to 30% from USDA. Uh, they don't always give you 30%, but if you did get 20%, uh, that would be equivalent uh, to a loan amount of about 8.2 million. So there'd be, what is that? About 2 million in grant or so. And then again, if, if, depending on how much grant we get, we would replace additional water mains that are at the top of the priority list. With, with these funding applications that we're pursuing, we're completing the planning for all the water main replacements so that we have that flexibility when we get a funding commitment from USDA, we don't have to go back and do a new environmental study because we want to replace that pipeline over there. So we're trying to get it all covered under the planning grant. And then again, seek the Irwin Grant for Spring Improvements. We're going to be working on that. That's Blake's challenge from here on out. He's all over it. We've got to have a grant for that. So any questions on water infrastructure? Sir? Did we treat our water with the same drain uh, leach fields failed? What? I thought we did. I'm not sure. Are you aware, Mark? Did, did, what? did you talk about it from Mount Shasta? No, their, their leach field failed. And they had to hook up to the Dunsmere City water. Or sewer. Oh, the 70s? Somewhere back in there. I don't remember the year, but I thought we put chlorine in the water at that time until it was resolved. Well, they may have back then, but I, I, don't, I don't know what happened back then. So. There is a chlorination facility there, but we're, we can't use it right now because of our tank uh, overflows. So we can't put chlorine in the water and allow it to overflow off the river. So it's it fine. been okay back then, but we can't do it today. So it's time to the idea of having to replace the water tank, move it higher up, because that will stop that from happening, which will also be put into the need for the chlorine, too. Yeah. No, this, this was at Chester Springs. There's no tank there. Well, I'm talking about from our standpoint, we was just saying that we can't be putting chlorine in because of the fact that we have a tank that we use now up at the high school, which overflows repeatedly. So that, solves, that, that causes a problem. So when we get the new tank, 
then we'll be able to chlorinate it. Is that correct? Yeah, so I, if I, what you're talking about back at the, there's a, I think it was the St. Germain property now, there was a problem with leach fields there. Uh, it caused a the problem in Dunsbury, and they had to chlorinate back then. We still have that facility, but the regulations back in the 70s are different than what they are today. So uh, we can't use that facility because our tank that we have overflows excess water out to back to Sacramento. So we have to build a new storage tank and have a new chlorination system so that if we, if we have to chlorinate, it stays in the system and doesn't come out. What do you say? What's the name of that tank? Uh, it's, it's up behind the, the high school. We have the location and the design. The wastewater. It's above ground storage tank. For water. Yeah, we, we call it the downtown storage tank. For water, the drinking water. So the water that comes down from the spring comes down and fills up that tank. So it, when there's a need for it, it's got the pressure right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, the, this infrastructure project, does that include all the replacement of the old pipes and stuff that we need to take care of. It includes a, a good portion of them, but not all of them. Has a study been done for all of them? What's that? Has a study been done for all of them? Yeah, yeah, we've... we've I mean, for everything. They know everything that needs to be done is how much can we afford to look at. Right, I just was wondering if there was an actual number. Yeah, so, so what we... Basically, we've got, you know, 10... Correct, they have a quarter million in, in this total unfunded amount here. These are still high priority pipelines that uh, you know we don't have an ability to pay for under the current rate structure. Now you can jack rates up and get loans, but we're not recommending that. Uh, the, the reason there's a surplus here is because we didn't get grant for the downtown tank, and we potentially have this additional million dollars for the spring improvements. Go ahead. Okay. So if you have a street that's got a leak mm -hmm. from an old pipe, right. the city goes in and supposedly fixes it, right. but then the leak starts again, and you get a sink hole? Yeah, sure. So somebody needs to call the city and tell them to get back out there. Well, are you saying there's a sink hole, or are you asking me if... I'm asking if that's possible, because oh. it's been fixed once. Right. And then I go back, and it's leaking up again. Yeah, I can tell you, ma'am, I've looked in some of the holes, and the city goes in with a repair clamp to put on, and there's six existing repair clamps that are inches <laughs> away that have been there for 30 years. Do they don't replace the whole thing? Well, no, it takes money. It takes I mean, it takes <laughs> They're Band-Aids. It, ta it takes that. So we're, we're well, trying to get there. Balancing how much does it cost for a sinkhole and people falling in and dying? Okay. I, I don't disagree, but, but you know. Somebody here. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably, sir. Um, this is the first time I've heard an actual discussion of the coliform and what might be the possible source of it. Do, is, it is it actually at the spring, or is that just the easiest place to chlorinate the water? Yeah, that... that the latter, and it is the easiest place because you can do it before any services take off, right? Yeah. There's a lot of speculation on where it's coming from. But the, the point is, is coliform bacteria is an indicator organism. You know, the, the bad one that we all, you know, hear about is fecal coliform. We're not talking about that here. This is, this is not fecal coliform. It, we're, our bodies are covered with coliform bacteria. But, it, it's an indicator organism that the state of California uses to, to basically evaluate the effectiveness of your disinfection. Yeah. Um, probably Mount Shasta, Weed, McLeod, Dunsmere are probably the last public water systems in the state of California that don't have chlorinated water. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, there's probably a few more, but the, the, the state would really love for you to chlorinate your water. That's how they kill the viruses and bacteria. And I grew up in weed, I get it. I, I don't like chlorinated water, even though I drink it now and ready, but I would hold out as long as you can, sir. Aren't the, aren't the numbers of detected coliform actually crazy, crazy low? Or am I wrong about that? No, you're, you're not wrong. Uh, they, they are low. I it, mean, so minuscule as to just barely tip the scale. Yeah, but it's on. a positive, and as far as the state concerned, you've yeah. got one 
uh, right. they call it most probable number per milliliter. Yeah. You know, and you're getting numbers of one or two. Right. You know, it's like really, you know, if, if you're not, if you don't do your due diligence taking a sample, right. and you you run water over the rim of your sample bottle, you can get a positive test. Yeah. Now, the city guys are. They know what they're doing, and I'm not suggesting that's an issue here, but that is how easy you can get a positive coliform. So there's a question over here, sir. It's interesting, looking back in history, the original water that came from that spring at Chester Springs area, uh, Moss Spray Falls, um, was in an open trough until it hit city limits on this side of the Sacramento River. Right. Then it went in the pipes. And the people didn't die, they didn't get sick. Yeah, I understand. But we're going to die, we're going to get sick. Yeah, I know. I, I, I understand. Yeah. I, I do have one question. I'd like to follow up. Go ahead, Pam. Um, I've heard people say that the likely source of our coliform bacteria is these broken pipes. Can you say anything about that hypothesis? Well, um, I don't want to discount that as a potential source, but. You know, the city has a sampling protocol throughout your distribution system. And based on where those positives are being measured, I think it's unlikely that it's coming from the brakes because the brakes are typically way down in the system. They're getting hits up towards the spring. And so we don't know exactly where it's coming from, but the state's been out a couple times to look at the springs. If you've ever, ever been up there, it's like walking into a museum. You know, there's there's some old stuff up there, and uh, that's the source of your drinking water, and it it does need to be improved. Will it solve the problem? I don't know. So you, I was just gonna say, and it sounds like you just answered me. Um, if we put in place the spring improvements, is there any chance in hell that we can ever go to the state and say? We have zero coliform bacteria and we don't want to chlorinate. Absolutely. And where it stands right now, the state is not mandating that the city chlorinate its water. Let me make that clear. All they're saying is that we want you to have facilities in standby so that when you have a positive coliform, we can direct you to chlorinate to disinfect your system and then turn it off clear your system out and go back to your spring water. That's all they're saying, ma'am. Would, they, would, would the city then inform us that that's actually happened? Absolutely, cool. yeah. They, there would be a, a notification protocol and you guys would know that that is coming. And, you know, again, drinking water regulations are written around chlorinating your water. That's how we protect public health. Those engineers in Reading know that if they ever mandate a community in South Siskiyou County to coordinate its water, that all of you and your family and friends are going to be on their doorstep and ready with pitchforks and guns. They know that. So I think all you can do at this point is try to appease them. They want you to provide emergency courses. They want you to improve the spring. That's what you need to do. See if you can eliminate the source or severely minimize. And, and if I understood the graphic you put up, actually right now, with it, we're not talking about rate increases here. You're just updating us on what's happening. That's right. Yeah, that's an important point. Um, and that's why I try to start with the first slide to say, look, these were the projects that were approved in the last rate study. And so those, the rates as they stand are able to accommodate some level of capital improvement. All we're trying to do is maximize the use of that capital with your means. But no, we're not proposing any water rate increases based on this. Uh, well, Sir? For people that have um, digestive uh, problems, uh, I've heard several ask, when I get these warnings, does that mean I should start filtering? And in a normal day, if they are in that, if they have a sensitive system, does that mean that they should be filtering? Or how do you look at that right now? Well, I think the city, Mark, maybe you could comment on this. The city has a standard notification protocol when it gets, a, I call it a hot coliform. And, you know, you've seen uh, it recommends you boil your water. Um, well, we never got to the recommending boiling, have we? No. 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 But there's a notification process, right? And it, it may say that, uh, you know, somebody with certain types of conditions could be affected. I don't know exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, 
it makes it clear. So I'm sure you're aware of the notice that we send out when there's a call form hit. Uh, we've sent a lot of them out this, this past year. Um, in there it says that there is no health or, uh, urgency. Um, so it's, you don't, and it says you don't need to boil your water. Um, so it, it's call form, like uh, Paul was saying, it's prevalent everywhere. You know, it's all over your body, it's in the air. It's, but it's an indicator. It doesn't mean there's anything dangerous in the water. It just means in, in the state's eyes, something got in your water. It's, it's where we have very pure water. So if there's a, a little microbe that showed up in a sample, it, where did that come from? It could have been a sampling. Uh, you know, it could be on the transportation there. It, it, it means something got in the water. If we chlorinate the water and something goes in there, chlorine attacks it. It's gone. So that's what the state likes. Put some chlorine in there. Uh, and if anything gets in the water, that's what that chlorine is there for. We don't chlorinate. So if something gets in the water, it shows up in the testing. And they can, it's very, it's, you have to be really careful when you do those tests that you, your, if that sample is done correctly. And our guys have been trained and can do that. Um, but Mount Shasta and Cloud, they don't chlorinate, they get hits too. It's one of the things that you're going to not chlorinate the water, there's going to be times you're going to get these, these notices. Mark, I have a quick question. My home was built in 2000. I live at North Chester. I replaced my kitchen faucet two years ago, and I now have a pinhole leak. Does that come from the chloroform or the no, coliform does not, uh, the, the question was uh, a new home uh, that was built in 2000 and she recently developed a pinhole leak, meaning there's, a, there's water coming out of the pipes. Um, I, that's most likely a construction issue. Do you know what kind of pipe it is? If it's copper, metal, or plastic? It's copper. Copper. There, so typically in a copper system, if you have uh, sometimes fittings that may not be matched or incompatible, where it's like aluminum or some type of iron, uh, you have those dissimilar metals, uh, and they will cause corrosion. So that might you might want to have the plumber look to see if there's you something else. Him. Okay, yeah, th I, that's a good question for him. This should not happen. It's definitely not the city's water. The water, uh, we have homes, our pipes are over 100 years old, and many of them are still working. Copper is very prone to freezing as well. I don't know, are we talking in the house or underneath the house? It's my kitchen faucet. Yeah. Yeah, the of, faucet itself or underneath? The the faucet is uh, that's a problem with the faucet. Uh, uh, we had a fee increase in uh, 2010. Uh, the three uh, increases, notwithstanding. The second and third were postponed in the years 2011 and 2012, respectively. Yet, and we had uh, water rate uh, studies by PASTA. In almost every single year. Uh, has there been, uh, with, with regard to uh, water main replacements, uh, identified a new breaking that, uh, that superseded the projected cost of repairing all of those uh, pipes that were to be paid for by those three rate increases? The first rate increase was to be to retire the old bonds for the water, the second was for the maintenance, and the third was for the water tower. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing in 2016 these new uh, rate increases. Is there such a great disparity in our identified problems that we needed, or the first rate increases were insufficient? Uh, you know, I'm not sure about going back in, in that time, but I, and I should probably get Paul in on this. We had a, a water master plan that was recently done and identified, you know, where are the most critical needs. Are they the different from the ones that were done in 2010, 2011, and 12? Uh, um, if I could, one of the things that might be confusing is the question is when was the last rate study done? In other words, you look at a plan, you come up with a plan, and you say these are the things that we have to do. So. In 2015, we spent a year 
looking at all of the things that were there. We recognized that there were things that hadn't been done before that were planned and didn't get done. But what we have as a document that was created along with that is a plan that said, here are all the problems. Here's the age of everything. Here's what needs to be done. And so what we basically came up with was as much as we could afford to do within the idea that we can't overcharge the people. It's a balancing act. Okay, and, but the question is, uh, were the initial assessments of those three rate increases insufficient? Well, they ended up not being yeah. And yeah. for what reason? The, the answer is yes, because at that time, the city's most recent master water plan was performed in 1994. And so during that era you're talking about, uh, there was, you know, everything was based on trying to inflate numbers that were done several years prior. But you did, you did rate we, studies submitted to the city after that. Yes, now I'm getting to that. Okay. Okay. In 2015, we did uh, a water rate study and a master plan at the same time, the master water plan. So that master water plan updated a 25-year-old plan. And so, so and it, was there such a great disparity in what was, what was identified then between the the rate study prior to that and the one in 2015? Well, there was no rate study in the 2012 era that you're talking about. Well, there was a proposed uh, rate study that was submitted to this. Well, there, 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 was a, there was a rate increase proposed. There was no study done. There was no master plan to support that. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So, so you know. Uh, we have identified from the last or a, a master rate plan, a great deal more uh, uh, pipes that need to be replaced. Is that correct? Compared to the 94 plan? Yeah, what, what you said. Oh, well, it's probably not much different. The thing that changes the inflationary cost of construction, number one, because in the 94 plan, we said, hey, city, you've got 60,000 feet of pipe that's reaching its useful life. Probably need to a plan to replace that. The city didn't do anything. Okay, so, um, you know, and then we identified more specific projects to do in 94. The city actually did a lot of those, not all of them. It didn't do anything to the 60,000 feet of pipe that we recommended 25 years prior. So we're, we're dealing with that right now. And the pipes are getting older. They're breaking more frequently. And so it's kind of like, you know, each year we evaluate, okay, what's the highest priority now? We had a huge leak on, or a huge leak on Cedar Street. We have a big cast iron pipe. We've got repair couplings all along the thing. That thing's got to be replaced. So all of a sudden it trumps. It was reported that we replaced about one quarter of the, uh, of the pipes that we, uh, that we need to do, according to the city manager. That's a right. quarter? Uh, well, in 2010 they reduced. Yeah, I'd have to look at those numbers. Well, they reported. Well, I could say the, the fundamental idea here is, is that in the past people were rating, increasing rates without backing it up with a plan. For 25 years, that's the way they did it. What we did, what we did this time is in 2015 is we actually sat down and started off with what needs to be done to do a complete assessment that, of every year. Well, supposedly why uh, under Proposition uh, 218 yeah. that we identify certain funds only to be used for these specific projects. Yeah. I mean, and those things were, were supposed to be addressed by that pay, uh, fee increase. Right. Are we now overlapping that by, no. by still saying that hasn't been done, the initial increases were for not, and that we need to increase those increases? No, no, what we're saying is that in 2016, the council put in place after the Prop 218, they put in place a rate increase that is a five-year plan. Each of the years, there's a little bit of an increase, the same thing we did here, so we didn't have to jack it all the way up at the same time. But we're still working off that plan. There's still a list of all the things that we know how old they are, we know what's breaking. And so what we're doing now is simply taking those numbers and then saying, how do we come up with the money for it? There's nothing else going on here except those two things. And it's different than the past, and I know in the past when you don't have the numbers, you can get a lot of suspicion that things are going on. But if you go home tonight and you look at the numbers here, I think you'll see that they all match up. These are the needs, this is this block will get fixed at this particular time, this block, as long as we got the money, that's what we're working off right now. We know all the needs, 
how can we come up with the money to right. fix them as fast as possible? But what about in 2010, the things that were not taken care of? All we know is, is what we had in 2015. Uh, that, also, that, in 2015, they looked. They didn't say what, would, what was going on in 2010. They said, what are the state of repairs? How old are the different things in 2015? We didn't look at 2010 and 2011. Well, you should have. Why? Because they weren't done. You're well, referring to sewer. Done. Right. You're referring to sewer. Uh, we didn't yeah. have the money. No, I'm referring we're to We're putting the bands. Oh, yeah, you're right. Which part? You're we're, right. We're getting to that. You're right. Sorry. Uh, also, uh, with regard to uh, wastewater, um, the uh, water board said that they might be, uh, there might be a chance uh, that we, the fines that would be assessed against the city by the by the city for its improvements? That's true. Did that happen? Uh, it will happen, but the fines pale in comparison to what needs to be done. But yeah, that, they're called uh, um, minimum mandatory penalties, and those can be applied to a future project. And, and that will happen once the city does a project. Thank you. Sure. I have a couple of questions, uh, questions of clarification back on the coronation business. Um, okay. Uh, are you saying that the city is unable to disinfect the system or the uh, because of the water overflows into the river? Yes. So when there is coliform, they can't uh, disinfect the, the storage tank. Is that Right. Okay. Yeah, that's what we're saying. And so, and the state of California is not currently mandating chlorinating the water. Are they, is the state mandating that the chlorine treatment plant, in, uh, is the state of California mandating the chlorine treatment plant improvements that would make it possible to be able to disinfect the system? Yeah, and we're calling it them emergency chlorination facilities. Okay. That's what they're requiring. Okay. Okay. And those facilities would be used on a temporary basis if the city experienced positive coliform tests. And that is currently being mandated by the state? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's why we have wastewater treatment plant improvements on the, up there? This, this, is, this is sewer, this is wastewater. You oh, and I were just talking about yeah. water, right? right. Okay. okay. Do you want me to go back to that slide? Uh, yeah. Okay. I thought the slide looked different. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't change it. Sorry about that. I'm pulling over on you. Um, yeah. yeah. The emergency chlorination. Yeah. Yeah. That's this this one right here. So I, you know, emergency chlorination is the biggest part of it, but they also want the spring well and piping improvements as well. And, and what a spring well is, is if you've ever been up to the spring, the water just wells out of the side of the mountain right above Montgomery Falls. And so the city has to uh, build kind of a protective door to keep critters and things out of your drinking water. And so the, that's what we refer to as well. And they have concrete boxes where they collect groundwater. And they're just old. They're really old. And then what's the piping um, at that facility, the, the city collects water from six or seven locations above Mossbray Falls. The spring comes, you know, bubbles out of the ground, and they build concrete, call them spring wells, around the spring with a lid on it, and that protects that water source from critters and birds and that kind of thing. Well, those spring wells are dilapidated. They're old, some are old concrete, some have steel lids that are all corroded, some even have wood lids. And when Division of Drinking Water went up there and looked at those things, they said, oh man, that, that could be improved. And so between all those spring wells is this above ground old steel piping that conveys, collects the water and conveys it down into the city. So they want that whole system improved. Yeah, you were some of the, um, with the, um Yes, that's what we're speculating. That honestly, that's what we're hoping for. Yeah. If we can do a project there, clean it up at that point, knowing that the rest of your system is good, that would be the best case scenario. Yes. So we've got our fingers crossed that that would. So we still have that coronation emergency thing. <laughs> well, yeah, but but if you never violate, you'll never have to use it, right? Yeah. So what are they thinking about um, doing that project? Well, we're, we're uh, in the process of applying for funding, and the goal would be that we would start construction in some fashion before the end of the year. So, 
We'll see. You guys ready to move on to the sewer? Okay, you guys ready for sewer? Mary? Ready for sewer? We're all ready for sewer. All right. Okay, so this is a table, kind of a, a rendition of a table from the 2007 Master Sewer Plan. And these are projects that we identified in the 2007 plan as need to be completed by the city. Uh, one, one special exception here is this project here. And I'll explain. The master plan was done in 2007. The city had an update to its NPDES permit for its wastewater treatment plant in 2010. NPDES stands for National Pollution Discharge Elimination System Permit. And every wastewater treatment plant in the United States has one of those permits. And Dunsmuir's no different. So in 2000, we did the master plan in 2007. The state comes along in 2010 and says, hey, you guys need to remove ammonia and copper and zinc and do all these improvements to your plant. It's like, shit, we just finished our master plan. So that led to about five million bucks worth of improvements on top of what we had identified in the, the master plan. So fortunately, the, rating, the sewer rate increases the city had in 2010 and 11 qualified it for grant funding and it got the five and a half million dollar grant that I had mentioned before. And it ended, this was a financing package. It was Clean Water State Revolving Fund and it was like 73% grant, 27% loan and you were able to complete all of those projects. Yay! Now, kind of back to Mary's question on uh, the collection system deficiencies that were identified in the master plan and some of the treatment plan improvements, those were all done. The treatment plan improvements were done. The collection system deficiencies were not because the state wasn't interested in correcting deficiencies in the collection system, they wanted the city to focus on reducing I&I, and, I, and they weren't necessarily one and the same. I&I I is an acronym for infiltration and inflow. It's basically leakage into the system, okay? So the, the existing collection system deficiencies that we identified in the master plan, they didn't get done as part of this project because it didn't fit with what the city wanted to fund with that project. So I talked about the Proposition 1 planning grants that went into a that were passed in November 2014. The city was able to get two planning grants for its wastewater system, a half million dollars for collection, half million dollars for treatment. And so the city has been able to perform the planning in almost all the design for these two projects, which were identified in the 2007 study. So my next slide will talk a little bit about strategy as far as how We'd like to fund those. <clears throat> so the 2007 master plan was really geared toward reducing I&I. &I. We didn't spend a ton of effort trying to evaluate the condition of the infrastructure. We went out and we did wet weather monitoring. We were trying to identify where the leaking areas were because that was the focus at the time when the city had limited resources to do the work. So currently, uh, the city got a half million dollar planning grant. This is the this is the four million dollar project I mentioned in the sewer rate study as us being able to do if if the city decides to pass those rates. It says four and a half million because I've included the five hundred thousand dollar planning grant in there, but the net is four million, and that's what you saw in the previous slides when I was talking about. Uh, that project. So, every five years you get a new NPDES permit. Well, what happened in 2015? You got another new permit because the last one went into effect in 2010, three years after your master plan. Another permit went into effect in 2015 and you're hit with another round of regulatory requirements at your wastewater treatment plant. So that's what this is. This was not reflected in the master plan. This is something that's materialized in the last few years. So the city was able to get half a million dollar planning grant for that project to do the planning and design. That work is ongoing. The, the one advantage for the treatment plant project is like I said before, the state, they impose these requirements, but they understand 
to some degree, the financial impacts to small communities like Densmere. I think there's, excuse me, a high likelihood that the city could get all grant for that project. So that's what we're holding out for. Um, it's not something the state isn't putting enough pressure on the city to force it to do something right now. So I think we've got a little bit of time. And I, we think it's a good candidate for 100% grant through Clean Water State Revolving Fund. So that's our, that's our approach. We're not gonna raise rates to try to fund it. We're gonna go for grant. If we don't get grant, we won't be able to afford it for a while. So that's kind of the mentality there. But this project here, this is the project that we identified in as wanting to do with the rate study. So these two green projects here, as part of the planning grant, we were able to do quite a bit of analysis with the collection system. We were able to put flow meters throughout the collection system and collect real-time data. We were able to do some closed-circuit television inspection uh, and really do a detailed evaluation of the collection system, which really hadn't been ever been done. It wasn't done as part of the 2007 master plan because there were no resources to do it. So with the planning grant, we were able to do that. And so these two projects here, you see there's about, there's almost eight million bucks there. Those projects are really intended to replace old clay concrete sewers that are past their useful life. They're not necessarily extreme maintenance problems for the city yet. They're not necessarily contributing a tremendous amount of leakage yet, but they've reached their useful life. So that's something that the city is going to have to work on in the coming years is a financial plan to fund those improvements. There's nothing built into the proposed rates that would deal with that. So there, there's kind of a summary on what, on the projects on the sewer side that the city and its consultants are working actively on. You know, you've seen it already. This is the four and a half million one. This will be loan funded, uh, design and planning ongoing. We're getting pretty close to design, aren't we, Curtis? Uh, wastewater treatment plant, same thing. We're, we'll be able to do all the planning and a good portion of design with the planning grants. So you got 10 million bucks there, less than a million dollar planning grants that the city got for a total project of nine, and that leaves the seven almost eight million unfunded, which were the two green projects on the previous slide. So recommendations, proceed with the USDA loan grant funding application for four and a half million, less than 500 planning grant, get you to one, or I'm sorry, get you to four. Uh, again, the city should qualify for some grant money from USDA. You can get up to 30%, maybe you get 20, if you did get 20, the loan amount would be about 3.8. Um, apply for grants for the treatment plant project, that's my recommendation. And start thinking about how you're gonna deal with the two green projects on there in the coming years. You're gonna have to develop a financial plan for that. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Could you go back to three slides to the show those green things? Sure. Excuse me, sir, but um, can you email your slides to us? Absolutely. They're on the city website. They're on the city website? Yeah, the, the city's website has uh, today's presentation. It has an actual rate study for both the sewer and the uh, garbage. Um, and the presentation is from past, past. Everything that we've been doing is on the city's website. Can you uh, put in layman's terms, what is collection system replacement? Where your poop goes. Yeah, uh, the sewer pipes and the roads. The pipes? Yeah, sewer pipes uh -huh. and the road. Uh -huh. the, you, know, you see manhole lids in the road. Uh -huh. There's pipes that run between those uh -huh. manholes. And the pipes are on a slope so that when you flush the toilet or take a shower, that water runs down slope uh -huh. through those pipes and uh -huh. manholes all the way down to the wastewater plant. So the so collection replacement, the collection system, it's the pipes, it's the manholes as well, oh, okay. and it's also the lateral portion that goes from the main to, to your property, okay. Okay. okay, so it's the portion in the public right away, you bet. Uh, thank you. Okay.
Oh, in the place of Yeah. In the public right away, we so that's why we call it collection system because it is main, it is manholes, it is laterals. Uh -huh. So we that's referred to in the industry as the collection system. So in water, a water system is referred to as a distribution system. Uh -huh. That's the main, uh -huh. the water service, yeah. the meter, the fire the valves. Uh -huh. That all inclusive is a distribution system. Sewage collection. System. Yeah, you can call it that. Yeah. I just about out last one. We got a couple of holdouts here. <laughs> Are you all set with your questions? Do you want to make sure you get them on? I just want to get your business card and then I can call or email if I have more questions. Thank you. You betcha. Okay. So I think we have an audience of five at this point. <laughs> so thank you all that stuck around. I hope we answered your questions. I, I think the most important thing, and I, I felt this all along, is to understand that all we really are doing is looking at what the needs are and yeah, figuring anytime. out how we come we up with the costs okay. that are the most fair and the lowest. And so I hope if you take a look at the information and share it with everybody else, let them know this video will be online. Um, thank you very much. Looking forward to making our city better. Yeah. Thank you. Paul, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.